So we've had some enormous progress in Europe in terms of policy and regulatory developments over the past couple of years. But we also, I think, all agree that we've got quite a bit of homework to do. So I'm very excited to have this outstanding uh, panel of speakers representing governments and, and from the private sector as well to look into some of the lessons learned as well as what, can, what need, we need to focus on uh, to, to go forward. With that, I will have, I'm happy to introduce um, Peel Krog Tigerson, Chief Advisor, uh, Minister of Climate, Energy and Utilities, Danish um, Energy Agency, Matt Taylor, Deputy Director, Transport and Storage, UK's Department of Energy Security and Net Zero. We have Joel Reckers, uh, Coordinating Policy Advisor, Subsurface Energy Transition, Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Policy. Stefan Tando, Head of Climate Change and Government Affairs at ArcelorMittal. And our fifth speaker from Energy and Sand, his apologies this morning, and he couldn't be joining us because he had a health emergency. But looking very much looking forward to this conversation. We'll, of, of course, take questions at the end. But without further ado, I would just like to turn to my speakers and ask them perhaps to give a bit of an update, an overview of, firstly, what's been going on in their countries. And then I'll come back to Stefan about his company as well. But perhaps if I could start with you, Peel. Thank you very much. Am I, is my mic working? Yep. yep. Um, well, thank you for the opportunity. Um, the Danish uh, CCS policy has been moving very quickly over the past few years. Uh, some of you may know this and some of you may not, but um, CCS entered the Danish climate policy in 2020 with a large multipartisan agreement. Up until 2020, there was no active uh, policy on CCS in Denmark. So everything that has happened since then has, hap has to happen at a fast forward pace. So just to give a brief overview of where we are right now, uh, this year so far has been a series of uh, breakthroughs in the Danish CCS policy. Um, we had a first uh, pilot CO2 storage project, the Greenstand project, um, which was carried out by uh, Ineas among other partners. And uh, also, this, prior to this, uh, we had signed a bilateral agreement uh, with Belgium on transportation of CO2 across borders uh, in accordance to the London Protocol. So that was a huge uh, milestone in Danish CCS policy. Uh, another huge milestone was the issuing of our first three full-scale permits for exploration and storage of CO2 in the Danish North Sea. These were issued in February this year. Um, and then we had, uh, following from the agreement that I mentioned before, there was quite a lot of uh, funds allocated for CCS uh, in Denmark. Um, I did a translation of the amounts. It, it amounts to about 5 billion US dollars. And I know we just heard the numbers from the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, so, uh, but in a Danish uh, policy context, that's a very large amount for a small country. We have a small economy. Um, and the first round of the, these funds was actually fell into place uh, just about a month ago with the signing of contract with the Danish company Erstal, who pledged to capture uh, 430,000 tons per year for 20 years. And they were allocated about uh, 1 billion US dollars. So there's still uh, some significant funds to, uh, to allocate uh, in the coming years. Um, so those are the major milestones that have passed recently in Danish CCS policy. And then, of course, uh, this is a policy area moving forward. And uh, a lot of our partners are very helpful in pointing out all the future issues that need to be smoothed out. Uh, we have some regulatory issues uh, with some of our point sources uh, that we need to figure out. And we're working quickly at that. And then, of course, there's the whole um, infrastructure for transportation. and. Uh, the market for carbon credits and all these things, which I'm sure many of you recognize. But I'll assure you that we're, we're on the case and we're working as quickly as we can. 
Thanks very much for that, Theo. And as also Jared referred to, the, the momentum that's shown in Denmark in such a short period of time when there is cross-party support, there is public-private partnership, I think it's just an amazing example of what can be achieved. Needless to say, there's a lot more to do, but I think the momentum is just, just fabulous. So with that, can I turn over to Matt to hear what the UK government has been up to? And that's quite a lot too. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. And um, very jealous of what's going on in Denmark at the moment. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating to see um, what's going on and causes lots of questions for me to deal with back in, back in the UK about how the Danes doing that so quickly? Why aren't we going faster? Um, but in the UK, we've been doing quite busy as well. <coughs> you can see there's a bit of a competition starting for the time. Um, in the UK, uh, <coughs> starting at the sort of legal or the regulatory level, um, we have a energy bill going through the um, Houses of Parliament at the moment. Um, that piece of legislation will establish and set out the economic regulatory framework for CO2 transport uh, and storage. So we are looking to establish transport and storage networks in the UK under the regulated asset-based model. So um, in that sort of context, a transport storage company developer would look to come to develop a transport storage network. Uh, and then <clears throat> those costs effectively are regulated by, um, would be regulated by uh, Ofgem, the, regu the economic regulator for CO2 transport and storage. Um, because in the UK, the approach we're taking is that the economic framework is there and designed to take to test, or sorry, not to test, but to protect the interests of the users of the network. So for us, a big focus is on is how do we ensure that the users of the network uh, are insulated against sort of excessive costs of CO2 transport and storage. And we're seeking to do that through the, the legal structures that we're taking through um, at the moment. Um, in March this year, uh, the Chancellor announced £20 billion um, pounds worth of support uh, for CO2 transport, uh, for, for CCS, sorry. Um, that is, was in association with um, the announcement of those capture projects that we're looking to take forward to support and enable the first two uh, CCS clusters in the UK. So one on the uh, east coast of, the, of, of England, uh, the east, east coast uh, cluster, uh, and one on the west coast of England, the high net cluster. Uh, so those projects were, uh, uh, the emitter projects that are going to support those clusters were announced uh, earlier on this year, uh, along with 20 billion of um, funding to support that. Um, also this year, uh, we have indicated our intentions to start the process for the second round of clusters uh, in the UK. So the UK's um, broader 2030 ambitions are to establish four CCS clusters by 2030, capturing in the, round, in the region of 20 to 30 million tonnes of CO2 um, per annum as well. So we've announced um, the first two clusters and we've announced the process uh, to start for the second two clusters as well, as well as starting to think about the extension projects uh, associated with the first two clusters. Um, in between all of that, uh, we're starting to think about um, cross-border movement of CO2. So we're getting a lot of interest from companies within uh, Europe about wanting to understand how they can access the UK continental shelf, uh, tapping into the storage potential that's there. Um, have been engaged with um, member states from the EU as well, trying to understand uh, what they're doing and how they're thinking about um, uh, issues around London Protocol, for example, and how to, how to manage that. Um, and uh, finally, we started to think about sort of the future as well. So the North Sea Transition Authority, our regulatory body, announced uh, or offered up 20 licences uh, for real estate or potential stored locations uh, across the UK continental shelf uh, just a couple of weeks ago. So a fairly busy period as well. Indeed, and we know that there's a lot of thought that's gone into designing the business models and a lot of thought and planning is going on to sequencing and uh, storage and permitting issues we'll dive into in our conversation in a little bit more. But thank you for that, Matt. If I can turn to Joel, of course, Netherlands is a country that's had a sort of a lot of interest for a long time in CCS. Can I ask what's been happening in Netherlands in the past few years from a policy and regulatory framework point of view? Yes, yeah, for sure. Um, and I have to, and have to start at the progress that is being made in, in Denmark is quite um, inspirational, I'd say, and I think it's, it's a good thing that we feel some competition uh, <laughs> between those North Sea countries. I think that's only in the benefit for, uh, for everyone, and, in, and at least uh, for the climate. Um, so um, I think like a lot of is already known, uh, but I will start at least like we, we have uh, the Portals project, which is probably familiar with all of you, um, started in 2017. Um, it has been, it looks like it has been stalled um, because of the uh, court ruling on the nitrogen deposition that is uh, occurring during the construction phase. 
but behind the scenes, the project is still continuing, preparations, um, getting ready that as soon as we get a positive court ruling that they're also uh, ready to go. Um, so despite some of some delay because of these uh, kind of legal procedures, um, yeah, we still hope that uh, one, if there isn't a final decision, uh, investment decision being made, they can start uh, building fairly, uh, fairly soon. Um, but what we also see is that um, because of the, the because of the Portis project, we see a lot of interest from uh, from different uh, uh, private companies. Um, it's not just uh, it's just not just not the two or three, but we see a lot of different uh, developments. Um, of course, it's the Aramis project, a consortium uh, of, of several companies, um, yeah, working on developing a, a really large. A large scale infrastructure of about 22 megatons uh, on the North Sea, uh, connecting to several storage locations up north, uh, about 200 kilometers northwest of the uh, Dutch coast. Um, we have already some, uh, I, I would say, two or three storage uh, permits under uh, under application that will be uh, that we're reviewing. Uh, we have more to uh, we're expecting more to come over the over the summer, uh, which will add up to at least seven and a half megaton of storage capacity uh, well, as of say 2027 or 2028. Um, but we also see that we see a large demand for storage, for capture or for transport and storage capacity um, from the Netherlands, but also from our neighboring, uh, neighboring countries in Northwest Europe. So we see a real need for uh, ramping up the development of storage locations in the North Sea because that, that's as we look forward 10 years, we see that as a real kind of a bottleneck for development and ramping up. Um, so we've, uh, we've made um, uh, some budget available uh, to, to, to support the uh, offshore operators that are now uh, working on, uh, on, on gas production to uh, kind of remodel their, uh, store, their, their um, depleted gas fields and uh, get that ready for storage. Uh, we also see starting some interest in uh, exploring whether CO2 could be stored in uh, saline aquifers as well. That's a very new uh, development for the Netherlands as we have so many uh, offshore gas production fields that uh, with infrastructure already in place, it's very natural to, to look at that for storage locations. And, uh, but. Um, yeah, CO2 storage in saline aquifers might be a cost-effective way, but that's still a, a, a development far away that will take in at least 10 years before that's fully um, explored and, and, and discovered and uh, assessed. Um, I would say another major, major part of our policy is uh, the subsidy. Uh, back in 2020, we already provided a bit more than 2 billion euros for those uh, uh, companies capture and storing their CO2 in the Portis <coughs> project. Recently, we announced that from uh, we have a, we have a special subsidy scheme called SDE. Uh, from the last, it's a very comp it's a competitive uh, it's a yeah kind of a, a bidding model. Um, the last we just uh, announced that over the last year uh, we uh, issued I would say up, almost up to seven billion euros for CO2 capture, transport, and storage for several uh, industrial players from the chemical sector, but also like waste incinerators. Um, and out on, top of, out on top of my head, I think it will add up about like four and a half megatons of CO2 reductions uh, uh, from that subsidy. Um, yeah, and for the rest, like there are, as my colleague from Denmark said, like there, there are always we're, a lot of things that needs to be solved. Uh, there are lots of concerns and lots of issues, lots of questions. Um, but I think that's well. Uh, I think that's part of the road the, ahead. Part of the road ahead, exactly. Right. And it's reassuring the support and the developments going on in CCS in Netherlands, despite the setback that that Portus has had, which we know is not related to CCS itself. It's the nitrogen exactly. issue, nevertheless. Yeah. Kind of good to hear from you that what's also happening in the background and that Portus is still going ahead with its preparations. Stefan, if I can turn to you, ArcelorMittal, one of the largest industrial companies globally, major steel manufacturer, and of course a big emitter. 
can I hear from you um, how CCS fits into your company's <coughs> strategy and plans? Yes, sure. Thanks, Gularen, first for the invitation. A few words to remind uh, to everyone why CCS is of utmost importance for us. Um, as you may know, steel represents 6 to 7 percent of the global CO2 emissions worldwide. Uh, we are the largest European player uh, with roughly 30 million tons of steel per year. This represents 60 million tons CO2 emissions today per year. Uh, so it's a huge problem we have to tackle. Uh, obviously, we will transform our industry priorities to abatement. Uh, so we will replace the blast furnaces by new technologies that will use hydrogen instead of coal and, uh, and electricity, green electricity. But CCS will remain a key, uh, a key element of the, of the equation because even moving the, the, to, to fossil fuel energy to uh, renewable energies, we will still have CO2 in the loop. Why? First of all, because uh, steel is basically iron and carbon. So we have carbon in the equation that we have to treat, and we will still have some sources where we, where we will need to use some, some uh, limited fossil quantities of fossil fuels. So at the end, we consider that we will have 10% of our emissions that cannot be abated and that need to be treated, that need to be captured and then uh, stored or transformed through CCU. Uh, today, we looked at all possible options, being CCU, being CCS. There is a lot of uh, uncertainties on CCU especially, uh, and we have much more op options uh, and see a, f a more clear uh, regulatory development for CCS. That's why we put a lot of uh, emphasis on that. We are currently testing uh, four different capturing technologies because we have various stacks with various gases which need different technological solutions. But we are also working uh, with uh, the various uh, providers for shipment, for storage, uh, because we need to prepare that. These quantities cannot be dealt uh, last minute, so we need to have a, a very good anticipation and work in advance with the, with the players. But we will come then, I guess, on the regulatory concerns. Yes, we will do. Um, all three countries' representatives have talked about permitting of, of licensing and permitting of storage. You've carried it out. Any lessons learned from the process so far um, and, and any thoughts? If I can maybe start with Matt about the sort of permitting process um, <clears throat> for storage in particular. Yeah, sure. So, the, so our, main, our first two CCS clusters are going to be focused around the endurance store. So that's the Saline Aquifer. Uh, and the Hamilton sort of fields in the um, on the west coast of England, and they are sort of depleted um, gas fields, or uh, well, they will be utilised in depleted gas fields. Um, and I, so I think you know, we share that sort of. Um, so we've got a mix there of mm. depleted oil and gas and, and endurance, and I think that's quite useful because you can start to learn um, just through that permitting process through the different types of geologies and different types of structures, the differences and. Um, there's some real sort of time learning, I suppose, that will go on through there. I think in the recent sort of uh, round, um, licensing, CCS licensing round that the NSTA ran uh, and announced the sort of 20 licenses, I think the, the first thing that we learned was there was a lot more interest than we were perhaps anticipating. Um, so both really, really heartening, but I think a real indicator to the market about the level of, of interest that's um, that's 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 demonstrating itself. I think um, associated with that is, I think for those people who are offered licenses, they will start to think about what's the route to market now? How do we sort of um, go about appraising those stores? Um, we think it will take sort of anywhere between four to eight, five to 10 years to go from where we are now of a, a license being offered all the way through to first injection. There's quite a long process, and I think the key thing around that permitting sort of time frame is going forward, how can you condense that and how can you reduce that? So we'll be looking to learn from other countries about the processes they're going through, what are the steps that they are taking sort of to condense those time scales because the volumes of CO2 storage that the UK will need to meet its emission reduction sort of targets mean that we could need, you know, in the region of 50 plus, maybe even 100 stores by 2050. Mm. So we really need to understand how we can reduce that time frame to from license award to first injection, and what other sort of um, you know how can technology, how can innovation help to speed up that process? So really, I think for me, it's about trying to reduce and think about how you go f reduce that time scale needed to sort of permit permanent store to um, first injection. Joel, any thoughts from you? Um, yes, we, like. <coughs> 
we've issued uh, storage permits um, for the Portus project. I think those are uh, those are two permits. Um, what we learned, like, um, like because we already have this depleted gas fields, we 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 don't need to uh, do the storage license because they don't need to. Uh, well, they do, can already do the appraisal because they already have the production license or the production permit for those uh, for those gas uh, for those wells. Um, so that time frame might be a bit shorter, but still they have to go through the whole uh, the technical appraisal. And what we see is that the storage storage permit, the application is very it's complicated. It's like 900 pages of application. So it's in order. <coughs> Before you can hand in you know, your request for a permit, you have already like two years of technical work by a team of at least 20 people. So it's quite time and, 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 and knowledge intensive. Um, so before, in order to have a company starting that, they already have to, uh, and they needed assurance that there will be clients, there will be, their, their pore space will be used for storage and there will be uh, infrastructure in place because otherwise you will not, well, you, you will, at least we will be hesitated to start investing uh, money in there. So uh, I think it's, it's good to recognize that. And that's also why we are why really pushed forward at the, the review of the 10 regulations to include also uh, storage in the SEF funding, because that's a, it's a very, well, it's one of the risks for, uh, for, for the, in the development. Um, I would say like we haven't had or issued that many permits yet that I can really say we have a learning from from the from the government side. Of course, like the second and the third one will be easier, but it will st still take time because every permit has its own technical difficulties and 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 and, and yeah, unique uh, challenges. challenges. Yeah, Neil, and you were also nodding your head when Matt was yeah. speaking about the time and exactly. and yeah. yes, and I can echo the uh, Netherlands experience that we haven't issued that many permits and we haven't had so many years to follow them yet. To, so I think some of the lessons are still ahead for us, mm -hmm. but uh, just learning from the process up until the point of issuing the, the permits uh, in Denmark, we've had the advantage of uh, in no way being a first mover, but being a uh, a late mover and uh, gaining from other countries' experiences and having the chance to look into the frameworks that have been built up in, in other countries. We've also had, um, we took the, the decision early on to transfer as much as possible from the framework for oil and gas mm. uh, exploration and production permits, although it is important to state that there are significant differences. Uh, just the difference between starting from a blank piece of paper and then adjusting existing policies is a, is a, is a factor. Um, and then a lesson for us has been that there's been a mutual understanding between us as an authority and the companies that we are engaging with in permits that not all the pieces of the puzzles are in place yet, mm. uh, but that shouldn't stop the projects from moving forward. Uh, and I think there's been a really good sort of uh, culture of cooperation, uh, even though we sort of represent different interests from a government point of view and a, and a private sector point of view. Um, but uh, I think sort of uh, mutual uh, patience that both sides might have some, some parts of the puzzle that still need to be figured out, I think has been very fruitful in the process so far. <coughs> Please, Matt. Just, just, just add one of the things that we're doing in the regulatory framework at the moment is um, making it a requirement for operators to retain information pertinent to CO, potential possible CO2 stores so that the NSTA can use that information and then put it into the public domain over a certain period of time. So the key thing there really is about open access to relevant information, sharing that information publicly so a wider pool of bodies, other companies can sort of review and not have to do things, repeat things over again just to get access. So, so information sharing, I think, around geology is really, really important. And um, that can help sort of speed up permitting and licensing processes by sharing information and, and knowledge, I think. Indeed. I mean, I was sort of, Joel mentioned the chicken egg problem of the CCS sort of value chain in essence. And, and I think Peel's example of, you know, how important this to have a strong trust between the public private kind of the partnerships where, you know, the pieces are not there, but that that kind of establishing that trust and how it's crucial to to and of course sort of 
overcoming information gaps through kind of transparency and putting that out there are some of the kind of, I think, key takeaways that I take from this. Stefan, I can, I can come to you and from the private sector's point of view, what regulatory um, challenges or opportunities um, do you see with, with transport and storage, particularly of CO2? Well, let's start first from the European level, because there were a lot of inputs given, uh, being from the CCS directive or the recent NZIA that gives obligations to member states and to, uh, to, to oil majors. Uh, this gives a kind of global frame. Um, and I would say with that, Europe is, has almost done its job. I will come back on that. Uh, now we are at the member state level, and uh, I'm very happy to have my colleagues here today, but we have just the first of the class here being present. Mm -hmm. And we are operating in various countries, from Spain to Poland, Germany, France, Belgium, and I can tell you that they are not all at the same level. We had, uh, till some weeks, some countries where there was a kind of denial on CCS. Why is it still needed? Because we will have hydrogen, we will solve the problem through abatement. And that's not true, as I explained before. So we need all member states to, do, uh, to be at the same pace. Uh, to work on their own uh, uh, NECP plans, to have the, the, the CCS which is defined, where it has to take place, uh, when to have a global plan, but also the own directives of the countries that define how we will uh, unbundle, all the sector will be regulated. We are still very far from that. Uh, I mentioned before that Europe has almost done its job. Um, there is one thing we consider is still to be done, it's uh, the concern of the ETS. Mm. Today we have uh, one neighbor country, which is UK, which is developing quite fast. Uh, we did not really touch on, the, on the, the capacity. That remains a big concern for us because we estimate that the demand in terms of CO2 storage will still be higher than the, than the offer. Uh, mm. Both are developing, but not at the same pace. Uh, so having some neighboring countries which have an offer which are developing quickly and not being able to access because the ETS does not recognize the, the right to claim for allowances, uh, then it's a big issue. Then we have no interest of storing in the UK uh, while this should, be, this should be clarified. So that's a big issue at, uh, at European level. But we also have some, uh, would say, uh, more minor roadblocks, uh, uh, but minor in the sense that can, they can be clarified uh, uh, much quicker. But if you are an investor and today you don't know in which country you will be able to export because the London Protocol has not been ratified. So we need to have these bilateral agreements and there are too few in, in Europe. Uh, working in France, where, can, where will we be able to export in three years? Which, which countries will, be, will, will be, there be an agreement? Say, same for Belgium, same for Spain. And this gives us a complete lack of clarity, meaning with which operators can we work? And then, uh, to, to conclude, there are also some very simple things like the, 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 the CO2 purity. Mm. Uh, today, uh, there are just a few operators that tell what they would like to have. I think we also need a certain uh, harmonization of the norms, also to be able to have an open market at the end. Because if everyone has his own uh, requirements, technical requirements, it will be very difficult for world to chain to work and to be able to uh, come to a finally an open market and a commercial market. Thank okay, you. You touched upon some, some of those like um, sort of issues that we need to address, um, some of the regulatory kind of um, sort of points that we need to come to. Perhaps I can kind of ask my panel, other panel speakers from governments, what they think about kind of in terms of policy or regulatory gaps within Europe that need to be kind of ideally overcome soon in order to sort of more um, successful scale up CCS faster. Maybe if I can start with Peel. Um, I think just to sort of supplement what's already been said, uh, from our point of view, uh, cross border infrastructure mm. is one of the main next tasks. Mm. Um, uh, we have policy systems for sort of uh, cross-border infrastructure in Europe that has served us for many years on pipelines for oil and gas and for electricity, but um, CO2 transportation is a different matter. Um, first of all, we don't have 30 years to let uh, some sort of system grow organically. We have to do it uh, at 10 double pace. And second of all, it's a, it's a more diverse and flexible uh, value chain for transportation uh, with ships, with rails, harbor terminals, liquefaction plants. We sort of need to broaden our definition of infrastructure for transportation mm -hmm. in this context. Um, and of course, this poses a challenge 
as I said earlier, because it has to be done, it has a, huge, a very high level of complexity, and it has to be done at a very high speed. Um, so I think this is something we're all sort of uh, trying to grapple together. And indeed, the modes of transport is an issue that we as the sort of CCS advocates and the ecosystem in Europe have been trying to raise, the, the need to recognize that there will be different modes of transport. It's not just pipelines or not, it's not even just ships. You might need barges, trucks, etc. So that's quite an, I think, important one to, to raise. Matt, if I can turn to you on that. Um, thoughts. <clears throat> so I agree with what Phil said around sort of pace mm. and, and the speed at which we need to move to reach those our sort of carbon targets and things like that. And I think that has a big influence on how you approach this sort of thing. I think the other question is, what sort of market do we really do we want? What sort of market are we envisaging? So some companies that I speak to in the UK when it comes to shipping MPT in particular, for example, non, you know, movement of CO2 by ship, um, they sort of, there are different elements of that value chain who see a market developing in very different ways. So an emitter might just say, I'll hand my CO2 over at the delivery point and then I don't care about it anymore. Um, and then who who is responsible for the shipping element, that relationship between the shipper and the CO2 store. Um, you know, shippers are saying to me, we envisage a pan-European market for the movement of CO2. Mm. Um, I think that means different types of infrastructure needing to be established. How do you coordinate that different type of infrastructure? You know, port side facilities, liquefaction, <laughs> What, what sort of commercial models are those shippers operating under and how does that drive sort of regulatory requirements, I suppose? CO2 spec is an obvious one, mm -hmm. but there's obviously London Protocol implications and everything else like that. But I think if you have a vision of a market where CO2 is being moved on a commoditized basis, um, there's competition for that CO2 being moved around, um, I think it takes you down one path. If you're looking at a market which is sort of very much sort of fixed infrastructure type, government backed, mm -hmm. high degree of government intervention, I think you're looking at a different regulatory framework at the same time. So I think the first question for me is what sort of market mm -hmm. for CO2 movement do we envisage in the future? And then that can help start to think through some of those broader regulatory issues mm -hmm. beyond this sort of technical associated with CO2 specs and things like that. And I've heard like yesterday in our members meeting too, um, mm -hmm. how sort of CO2 market is almost like, or in some ways like the LNG market and how it's going to develop and whether it's going to be commoditized and how soon it's going to be commoditized and can we just jump those steps to kind of come to that or et cetera. So lots of questions around the, um, the market development and, and how to therefore base the regulation, the infrastructure, et cetera, for, is it for the future market or for now? So some, some questions there. Joelle, if I can yeah. ask your opinion. Yeah, I totally recognize we're, we're, it's not a fully grown market yet, so we're really in the, in the, in the, still in the early phases with, it, with its growing pains as well and things that need to be sorted out. Um, <coughs> that, like, listening to, uh, to you, I also, heard, like, I also often hear that there are questions, questions from the private sector that um, might, uh, might already be sorted out, but it's just not communicated clearly. Um, for example, we have those, uh, or, or, or the Netherlands will be signing uh, bilateral agreements. For example, we have, we have announced uh, that we will be signing one together with Belgium. That was announced, I think, back in January or February. Um, we're very hopeful that it will happen quite soon. Mm. Um, but it's not necessary. Like, it is already allowed to transport the CO2 from Belgium to the Netherlands and vice versa. It's just that we want, we want to sign such an agreement just to provide a clear signal. Um, but the, the, regu the regu yeah, regulations or the, 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 the framework is already in place as, as long as those two countries have indeed uh, like fall under the, the EU ETS and the CCS directive and uh, have both ratified the amendment of the Article 6 of the London Protocol. So, yeah, I think like uh, we also need to communicate probably um, those things better just to make sure that they're not, not perceived risks because those would be it would be it's a important shame point. So perceived risk versus actual risk exactly. and information, kind of transparency of information, which will help the private sector gain more confidence and perhaps kind of a bit more understanding of the market development, having a bit more sense as to how, how things might unfold such that planning can be undertaken accordingly. Stefan, um, if we could talk about a little bit, again, transport and storage infrastructure, but do you think that there's clarity in terms of um, access and third-party access, and is there is there fairness kind of 
that's in the market from your point of view at the moment? No, definitely not. And again, uh, we can find uh, very good examples in Europe. Uh, as it was just mentioned, some countries give clarity. We have uh, signals, but uh, there are too few. Uh, and uh, especially the Article 21 uh, of the, the, the European uh, CCS uh, mm -hmm. directive uh, is not well defined in all the countries on how the markets will be structured in terms of transportation, in terms of storage, in terms of uh, hubs, who will be the operators, or will that work? Uh, there is, I think, too few anticipation in some major countries to, to, to give us the possibility to have a real project and developing on that. Can I look to speakers from the governments and any thoughts on or any kind of any um, what's already being either done to address this or any thoughts about how the market can be more um, fair and open and, and, and kind of get a guarantee open access for the third party access to big emitters but also smaller ones too because we'll hopefully have smaller emitters also connect to networks etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, Please. So, so I struggle with this one, I think, a little bit because mm. um, so we've got access to infrastructure regulations in the UK, uh, which set out the principles around open access and fairness and things like that. Um, but but sometimes I try to understand or wonder what people really mean by it because ultimately mm. this is a fixed infrastructure, and a CO two transport storage developer will build that infrastructure for a certain size, okay, and try and cost optimize it and everything else. And so if that capacity is then reached and somebody wants to join, well, there's a physical constraint and that's the, that the capacity has been reached. And so, yes, you could expand the capacity in the store, for example, I don't know, drill another well or something like that, but that comes at a cost. So who then pays that cost? Mm -hmm. And in the UK, the regulatory asset-based model is designed to sort of smear that cost across the user base. Mm. So that's the approach that we've taken in the UK. You could envisage access opening up over time to, to, to new emitters wanting to join networks in the UK, but the costs get smeared across. But again, it's not something that can happen overnight. So I think there's a bit of an expectation thing around what do we mean by open access and fairness. Yes, at the principal level, there, there has to be open access and fairness. I agree with that. But I think in at, at, at the sort of operational level, I still think that needs to be worked through about what that really means in practice because it's a physical infrastructure asset that has constraints. Yeah, I agree. I really recognize the, uh, the discussion. And I think also um, there's also a different interpretations. There's like open access and there's third party access, which is also in the, mm -hmm. um, in, in, in the community regulations. Um, and there's like, we see like like it's a new market and, and, and all the players are taking their positions and they want to optimize their positions. Um, so if you're not if you're if you're not getting access to the uh, like with like if there, if you do not like the constraints or the uh, requirements uh, to access doesn't mean you're not getting access, for example. So I think it's very good to uh, like we have a lot of these conversations with all the players in the market in the Netherlands and. Um, yeah, it's, it, 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 it's, it's sometimes a challenge to really filter out like what is, what is a true barrier and what is just optimizing um, well, your, um, your benefits, for example. Um, so I think that's, which is very, I think it's very normal, uh, those conversations, but it's also, um, yeah, kind of uh, making the, 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 the conversations, uh, at least for us, a bit more difficult. And perhaps it's to do with the timescales as well, kind of the first projects, the first infrastructure versus a few years down exactly. the line, kind of thinking yeah. about what the circumstances yeah. are now versus yeah. Yeah. how they're envisioned to be in the future or yeah. from a fairness point of view. So yeah, I think in this, in this stage of the market, um, both the emitter and the transport and storage provider, they need each other in order to get the project started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and hence the importance of networks and hence the UK government's preference yes. for coordinating it a little bit more. Perhaps. Yeah. Anything to add, Peel? Or I can uh, recognize the points made by both the UK and Netherlands, but I think also, uh, in from a Danish point of view, it's, it's very early days in establishing uh, the framework for for transportation. So uh, we're still still taking in input, and uh, yeah, I think we're all striving for the same goals. 
I want to come back to the issue of time scale, and I think Stefan, you mentioned, and I, I suppose most of us in this room agree or share the perception that storage in particular, but transport and storage does not seem to be sort of developing necessarily fast enough uh, to meet the demand or in sync with kind of captured developments. Can I um, ask all my speakers' views about this um, and, and how to better sync, so to speak, sort of capture with transport and storage? Maybe if I can start with you, Stefan. Yeah, sure. Um, back to our, to our industrial footprint. Today we have, uh, as I said, some BS that we'll replace, uh, that we th that will then um, <coughs> replace by equipment using uh, hydrogen at term, but natural gas in a transistor phase. But we also have some blast furnaces that will remain for a longer time. And uh, these are equipments that we could fit quite quickly with capture technologies mm. to be able to store. And uh, one BF, it's two million tons in one shot. So um, this needs really short-term available capacity. That's difficult to find today, also because the market is not mature. There are not enough players. The, the capacity are already booked by uh, other industries or uh, initial players. So it's difficult for us also to access uh, and to, to have this option. W one point we did not mention, which is also linked to the open market, uh, it's the cost at the end. Uh, we have a lot of constraints which are linked to this initial phase. The fact that we have to ship per vessel, for instance, uh, we are, and at the end, uh, also I spoke about the specifications, but at the end it brings the cost of uh, CCS for an industrial emitter like we are at the double of the EU allocations, the price of the EU allocations. So indeed Denmark, uh, Netherlands have uh, offered solutions that also give visibility to the emitters to, uh, to, to know what will be their business case if they engage, but it's not the case in, let's say, all other European countries yet. Any other thoughts? Um, well, we've touched upon it uh, like earlier as well, but um, I think what we also try to do with um, with the uh, with the our subsidy scheme, the SDE, uh, is when once the emitter applies for subsidy, uh, it is able to show that there is a a transport provider and a storage provider where he has already kind of like pre-booked uh, capacity. Mm. So uh, that uh, it kind of gives some security to all three, uh, well, three elements in the chain, in the value chain, that once there is a, a business case through the subsidy, there is also a transport and storage uh, provider and capacity available. What sort? Yeah, so the <coughs> co coordination point is, no. is a big one. Um, and that's why the UK sort of established its track processes mm. uh, where um, we engaged with CO2 storage providers and transport storage providers and emitters and went through a process of effectively identifying and, and, and sort of identifying projects um, and then fitting them with the transport storage company. But what I suspect we'll see over the next sort of couple of months or so is, you know, companies started to work through what it actually means to be connected to a transport storage network uh, and how that affects operations and how you might need to change the way that you think about operating your facility. So there's an ongoing relationship that needs to be had, I think, between um, a, a new series of relationships, I think, that will need to be developed over the longer term for companies engaged in CCS around that transport storage and that, that capture sort of thing. And, in, and it's also why we've announced sort of track one expansion and the next phase of the track process track two we're calling it which is around coordination and trying to sort of link link emitters with the transport storage company so the UK government's playing quite an active role um, in that space but over the longer term I think it comes back to your point about open access and fairness and things like that so how do you then establish a framework so emitters and transport storage companies can work together to sort of make those commercial arrangements that they'll need to make if I can just follow up on that, we've, we've had the considerations with the, with the funding for CCS that I mentioned earlier, that from a government side of view, we have, or point of view, we have a, a single point of contract, um, which isn't necessarily a particular part of the value chain, but just somebody who is responsible for the entire project. Um, and the funding is, uh, is sort of defined by tons of CO2 captured and stored which implies also transported, um, which means that we are sort of, we will provide financing, 
but leave the matchmaking between different parts of the value chain up to the market. Uh, and that's a good example of the approach we have chosen has been that our role is to ready up the playing field as much as possible and also sort of ex widen the playing field as much as possible um, and then leave the matchmaking and the timing and the contracts up to the market players. Mm -hmm. um, so that has been our approach to the, to the chicken and egg problem so far. Well, with that, I'd like to thank my um, speakers for this. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to open it up for questions from the audience. If we have any, do we have any mics? Many. In there? Well, we've got a lot of questions. Do we have, you know, could we help with the mics if there are any? Juho, can I start with you? And if, uh, for the questions, if you could state your name and your affiliation, please. Thank you. So yeah, happy to kick off. Yeah, my name is Juho Lippun, and I'm coordinator of the Clean Energy Ministerial CCUS Initiative. Um, uh, my question is to Stefan. Um, you're sitting next to three uh, government uh, representatives, all who participate in our work as well. But, um, and uh, you know, listening to them, um, are there elements in their CCUS policy package that kind of come up and, and that make you think, ah, oh, these are very helpful things that I as a industry player would value and appreciate if I was to put up a CCUS project in one of the countries. And, you don't need to make friends or enemies unnecessarily here, no. but uh, pick up some maybe per perhaps points that are particularly important for you that might come out of the uh, three government examples. Oh, I, I, and I will not make enemies because, as I said before, I think we have the good players here on, around, the, around the table. And uh, I think we could pick up a lot of good elements in all the, all the, all the three countries because they are really developing, uh, developing fast and making sure that there is a, a framework in place for the investors. As I mentioned before, for an investor, it's not a, a one criteria decision. We need to clear the funding. We clear, need to clear the long-term capacity. We need to make sure that we have hubs which are in place because indeed, as we just discussed, uh, we are uh, a big emitter, so we help to create uh, a certain flow, a certain backbone, but there are a lot of players that need to gather. We need to have a certain storage in place. So here too, the, the various countries need to uh, support the creation of those hubs. Uh, fortunately, we have uh, very good examples in the north of France, in Dunkerque, in, uh, in Belgium, close to Zeebrugge, uh, also close to the Netherlands, uh, where we have discussions. That's not the case everywhere, as I mentioned before, and that's again the discrepancy between the countries that I uh, that I see as the most uh, the most uh, uh, difficult. But uh, indeed, I think we, we could uh, we could look at the three countries which are here and, and take them as example for the other ones, because not everything is perfect, but it gives already a lot of visibility on all the elements to investors. Perhaps I'll take two more questions. I know there were quite a few, but over there, please. Yes. Um, Rachel Moore, independent consultant. <coughs> so I work mostly with the countries that are miles behind the people on the panel. Um, so, and I wanted to ask Peel, how can you take the experience that Denmark has had of moving at speed and translate this to the global south, to countries that don't necessarily have legal and regulatory frameworks in place, but know they want to do this? Wow, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, obviously, there are some challenging, challenges in assuming that you can just export one policy framework from one political and cultural context to another. Um, but I think uh, if, if I were to point out some elements that I think were worth exporting uh, from our framework or from the development of from our framework has been um, beginning with uh, very uh, wide political backing uh, across uh, most of the parties in Parliament. Uh, I think that adds to the point of the visibility and financial or sort of <coughs> investment security that was uh, alluded at before. So that investors will sort of have some reassurance that these very long-term investments won't be sort of uh, made impossible by a shifting of the political consensus four years from now. So I think that's that's one point, and that's maybe, I think, concerning more generally the political climate in, in Denmark and in our political tradition. 
And I think another point is um, we have been uh, lucky enough so far, and we hope to keep it up, to have had a wide public acceptance. Um, and I think uh, that would be both the, give the best results in the long run and also be sort of uh, the proper way of doing it, making sure that uh, we, right now we are investigating onshore, uh, potential onshore storage facilities and we're doing a lot of local engagement. Uh, that requires a lot of uh, resources uh, and it might not be the element that adds mostly to the speedy uh, rollout, but I think in the long run it will help us uh, avoid some, some later both uh, controversies and also delays. Um, and then I think uh, a third point is that we've had an extreme, and I mentioned it before, we've had an extremely close cooperation with private partners to sort of know the business case from their side of the table, uh, know what parts are important, knowing that we have to do everything quickly and we can't, even though we try to do everything at once, there has to be some sort of prioritization between the elements um, and to sort of test if we are matching the needs of industry in what, what's moving ahead first. Uh, I think those would be my, my three main points. But thank you for an excellent question. And one final question, Edward. Thank you, and uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Avery Pernot. I work for Cleaner Task Force. Uh, I'm going to complicate things a little bit by, make, by posing a problem that I really see at the moment in the policy space, and I'd be curious to get the thoughts of the panelists on this. So I come from the NGO world, and obviously CCS is very controversial technology. But one of the ways in which it's come to consensus now is that we need to prioritize CCS, but only for high priority applications for which there are very or little to no other alternatives, right? Cement, lime, uh, waste energy, for example. But a lot of these facilities are small, they're isolated, and they're the least likely to candidates to be the first candidates for infrastructure being built. And this is kind of like what Matt was, was indicating to that this is fixed infrastructure, and we need to, in order to scale this infrastructure, you need size and you need you know, high concentration C2 streams, this is kind of why the Dutch example is really focused on like refineries and, and clusters that are close to the coast. But these are also not the types of priorities that we see from a climate policy space when it comes to where should we deploy CCS. And I think that there's a bit of a mismatch, so I'd be curious to know how could we scale this technology knowing as well that there's also a time limit because how we look at you know, energy transition and you know, hydrogen might solve our problems we think now, but probably won't in 2040 if we don't have the you know, renewable capacity available to make all this green hydrogen. How do we develop this capacity and build this infrastructure knowing that there may also be a lot of applications that we'll need in 2040, but maybe aren't on the table right now? Thank you. Different time scale issue. Any thoughts? Well, I think that's an, ex an, an excellent summary of our, of our work. <laughs> It's, a, it's kind of welcome to our world. Um, <laughs> no, it's, ex it's exactly. You have to, sometimes you have to choose between would, do, do we want CO2, CO2, CO2 reductions fast between, uh, before 2030 or do we focus on maybe the rider uh, industries but that will come later or at a higher cost. So I think it's really it's like how I see it and it's, it's, it's maybe not concrete enough but it's a really balancing act because mm -hmm. If you try, you strive for the best solution. It might not, it might not start. Um, so, and you, you, and, and like my colleague from Denmark said, it's like sometimes you, you need to start, and then you're building your your policies along the way. Uh, you also, you, like we see also, like once we already started designing the policies, and then we had, for example, uh, the uh, the policy for the, the red three from the from the EU with the uh, like the percentage of, of, of green uh, in, in like hydrogen in the whole share that that might shift investment decisions by companies along the way. So they're always, uh, yeah, if, if you're going through it, like there are always sudden changes in, in policy or markets or, or gas prices that will influence your uh, yeah, the, the policy decisions you've made before. But I think it's important to, um, when you're designing infrastructure policy, whatever, for, for like right now we're very focused on 2030, uh, but we're already looking ahead for 2040 and beyond. And um, yeah, it's, it's trying to monitor and to model whether we could also accommodate um, 
uh, like the, the, the storage of CO2 emissions from negative emissions or from, um, from those uh, yeah, industrial sites further away and um, that will come later because of their higher costs. Yeah. So with that, I would like to thank all our speakers for their, this interesting discussion. There's great progress, lots more to do. Hopefully this was a thought-provoking conversation. And with that, let <laughs> And if I may invite Jared to introduce our keynote speaker.